Hello. I'm here with Elizabeth Colbert, author of The Sixth Extinction, An Unnatural History, which I have to say, Elizabeth, is actually a remarkably fun book for something that is in course dealing with something rather catastrophic. But tell us about the title. What, what exactly do you mean by The Sixth Extinction? Well, the sixth extinction obviously implies that there are five others. Uh, indeed, there were. Um, and the fifth was the one that did in the dinosaurs. And that was about 65 million years ago. And there's a pretty broad scientific consensus now that that was caused by an asteroid impact. So you will often hear people say, I've heard people, scientists say now, that we humans are the asteroid in this one. Right, and, and the point being that there's just an extraordinary number of animals that are, uh, species that are going extinct at this time, is that right? Yes, and that we are changing the planet very, very quickly. Um, maybe not as quickly as an asteroid impact, but on a geological sense, in the broad you know, span of geological history, very, very rapidly. Right, and there's a debate still going on for some reason, it seems, as to whether or not we should define this period as the Anthropocene, this idea that we are the ones defining that. Tell us a bit about that. Yeah, that's a really interesting issue. So technically we live in what's called the Holocene, if you're geology, if you remember your, you know, college geology, and that's the um, period since the end of the last ice age, about 12,000 years ago. So 12,000 years ago where we are sitting now in Manhattan was covered with ice and then the ice sheets receded. And now there's a question about whether we have entered a new epoch, should we be called the Anthropocene, because um, and when geologists ask this question, they don't ask the qu just the question, you know, are we having an impact on the planet? They say, are we having an impact on the planet that will be discernible millions and millions of years from now, the way we look back on geological history? And many geologists uh, say yes, mm. that what we're doing now in terms of changing the surface of the earth, changing the composition of the atmosphere, changing the chemistry of the oceans, will be leave a mark that if you were a geologist you know, 10 million years from now, you would still see that mark. Mm. Well, I mean, it's fascinating, but, you know, you, as I say, you sort of made this book kind of fun. You went around to a lot of places. One of the places you went was the Great Barrier Reef, and I have to say that as a child, at the age of nine, I ne remember distinctly, it's a very, very vivid memory and a very warm one, of swimming off the coast of Green Island and just being able to go out there with snorkels, and it's a remarkable sight. As a result, you know, I find it very disturbing to read the kind of information that's coming out of a book like yours, that these coral reefs in general may not be with us. Yeah, well, I, first of all, I, I just want to agree with you that it is the most extraordinary thing a person could hope to see to swim off the Great Barrier Reef. It's just like uh, falling into a nature movie is really the only way I can describe it. It's such an amazing profusion of life. And what's happening to coral reefs are under stress for a lot of reasons, but what I was there to look at with a group of scientists who are looking at the effects of um, our carbon emissions, so our power plant, cars, you know, everything that's putting carbon dioxide into the atmosphere is also putting carbon dioxide into the oceans because mm. the oceans and the air are just always in contact. And that has the effect when you dissolve CO2 in water, it's, it's an acid. Uh, it's a weak acid. You know, you drink it when you drink Coke, but it's an acid. And that has the effect of, of changing the water chemistry and corals when they make a reef they basically uh, construct it out of a mineral calcium carbonate and they have to construct that mineral put it together it's sort of almost like alchemy the way they do it and this makes it harder and harder for them to do it the more co2 is in the water so there are very uh, multiple people have arrived from various different ways of reckoning it at the prognosis for the reef, Great Barrier Reef and for reefs in general that is very grim um, and that suggests that by around the middle of the century uh, reefs will have a very very hard time keeping up growing fast enough to keep up with erosion and they will just sort of start to disintegrate. But they're critical incubators of life itself right? I mean what, what, right. Is, what does the world look like if we don't have coral reefs? Well. As, as you mentioned, you know, when you see it, you're really struck by this is where this is, you know, there's something that's called the rainforest of the ocean. They're just an extraordinary profusion of life. Something like 20, it's estimated that something like 25% of all marine fish spend part of their lives on reefs. So you're really talking about, 
you know, potentially very serious knock-on effects if you get rid of coral reefs, absolutely. So, I mean, it read to me like a travelogue, you know, of course, of, of course, an interesting book of history as well, uh, as well as all this sort of forward-looking analysis and scientific work as well. Um, but how did you go about finding the right tone there, right? Because as I say, yeah. had, it was fun. You, you referred yeah, to these jokes the way through it, <laughs> and, and yet you're dealing with something that's almost hard to joke about. How did you get that right? <laughs> Practice. Um, <laughs> No, it's, I really appreciate that. I hope that people, you know, it, it is such a grim topic that um, you want people to be sort of pulled along by, uh, there has to be some kind of payoff for reading it, you know, mm. besides the, the, the seriousness of it. And I hope that is a, actually, I know it sounds odd, but a, a pleasurable reading experience. And I, I really am very gratified to hear you say it was fun because I, I did put in what I hoped would be humor uh, and fun, and as mm. you say, I went. I, my own experience in writing it was actually paradoxically quite fun because mm. I went to all these amazing. Yeah, places. and I think to be honest, to, to to read a book that was just nothing but bad news would be very hard. So you, you get a good balance there. Um, we're, we're looking at an image of the, uh, the the longhorn beetle, which uh, you know, as you know, is, a, is a, a beast that has destroyed old forests in the northeast. It's yet one of countless uh, introduced species that are so invasive species that come in. Uh, really through the, the influence of, of human beings. What role has, have we played or has globalization played in the, this expansion of these invasive species into our yeah. uh, environment? Well, people have been, you know, carrying in, in, introduced and then introduced species that become invasive species with them for, for quite a long time. I mean, for example, when the Polynesians, you know, got to Hawaii and got to islands like Fiji and Samoa and places like that, they brought rats with them. And they there's very good evidence that those rats very quickly, you know, decimated a lot of the local birds, a lot of the local reptiles. And so this process started, you know, kind of slowly and now has been really supercharged by our global trade. Um, it's estimated, and global travel. So it's estimated that like in um, the ballast of super tankers every day, 10,000 species are being mm. moved around the world just in ballast mm. water. And there are you know, a lot of cases I could give you of, of species that probably arrived even with tourists, right? I mean, so as we, more and more of us move more and more stuff around the world and more and more mm. people around the world, there we, we bring along a lot of uh, fellow travelers. This is uh, the trailer for the movie Noah that is uh, coming out very soon. Uh, a lot of big buzz around it and big promo during the Super Bowl. Let's, let's run this one. So clearly this idea that we humans are able to uh, manage the destiny of the rest of the species of the world is something that's ingrained in our mythology and it goes a long, long way back. But you actually deal in the book about you know, zoos and pandas and, and rhinos and things like that that may never again be seen anywhere else but in the zoos. And in fact the critical role, given that we've made kind of a mess of everything else, that we are playing as a species in perpetuating these, these endangered species elsewhere. So, I mean, wh what does the world look like if we look into the future in this kind of environment? I mean, are we in fact building our own ark? Yeah, that's a really, I mean, that's a really interesting question. And, and, and sort of paradoxically, you have as more and more of the world is sort of emptied out, um, you have this situation where people are the only people who can, are the only creature who can save these creatures that, you know, human actions have endangered. Um, and you, uh, people take that very, very seriously. And I went to a number of, of zoos. People sometimes think of zoos as you know, just places where animals are kept in cages. But in fact, zoos are really active in trying to preserve those species in their care. And even species out in, the, in, 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 in other countries, zoos are really, really taking an active role mm. in that. So for example, um, one place that I visited out in San Diego has the only Hawaiian crows, about, there are about 100 Hawaiian crows left in the world, and they were desperately trying to save this species, and they had taken this one crow who refused to mate with right. his fellow crows, and they had a, a woman there who's sort of his caregiver, she's a very smart lady, and she has been sort of ministering to this crow for 
uh, years now, really, literally years, hours and hours, trying to get him, stroking him in get a way him in that the, get him in the mood that crows are supposed to find very erotic, oh, um, to try to get him to donate the, his. The genetic. level of intervention to that level just to perpetuate yeah, a species is yeah. incredible. We're going to do something that we do at the end of all of these these book segments. So you've, you've been warned about this. <laughs> uh, so good luck. You're going to pick from one of three questions, okay. and you're going to read it out, and then you're going to answer that okay, question. Okay. Okay. I want to go for the question on the bottom here. Uh, there you go. Okay. It's a okay. Pretty Okay. Tactic, huh? okay, yeah, yeah, well, let's see if this is a good idea. What do you hope will be the legacy of this book? Well, that I think gets back to a little bit just what we were talking about. I really hope the legacy of it will be um, to get people thinking. I guess many authors probably tell you that. Um, and to get people to to put some things together that maybe, you know, they've only heard in sort of dribs and drabs, and I, I hope it will get people to, I guess most ambitiously, I think, it, I hope that people will look at the world differently when they're done with it. All right. Well, Elizabeth Colbert, thank you very much for your time. The book is called The Sixth Extinction and Unnatural History. Thanks for joining us.